Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, back with the best investor in Fresno, California, and perhaps the country, Mr. Jason Pritchard. How are you doing, sir? I am doing very well, Zuber. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. So uh, we're going to change it up a little bit, right? We've talked about the changing market. We're putting on this amazing event, which is going to change people's lives on the 19th, REI Collaboration. $27 tickets. If you're not there, you're a fool. I'll just say that out loud. Especially if you're in California, Arizona, Nevada, Oregon. If you're not there, I don't know what to tell you. But it's going to be a great one, guys. Yeah, it's going to be life-changing for many, many folks. Uh, what I want to talk about here, though, is let's let's just rewind the clock for both of us and say, what if we were starting our journey, your journey of you know burning the boats, being a real estate investor, maybe talk about being a real estate agent today. I'll talk about being a buy and hold investor today. Um, you know, what, what, where, where would you start, right? You can't choose the market you're moving into. That's Life correct. happens, you know, yep. I, you know, what, what do you do, right? Uh, starting from scratch, what are you doing today? And I'll, I'll do the same. What, what, what's if it were me do? and our business models are different. So I actually, it, I think this is going to be a good conversation. So if it were me and I had burned all the boats and I was just diving all in, right. Mm -hmm. Um, what I would do if I were starting all over again, is I would learn how to get in front of as many sellers that are motivated to sell for some other reason besides netting as much money as they possibly can from the sale of their house, guys. Like for me, that's always my step one. I get this question a lot from a lot of people. What should I do if I'm getting started? What would you do differently if you were starting all over and you know what you know now, but you didn't have any money or anything like that? That for me has been such a pivotal part of my business because doing that allows you to buy properties at a discount. And my business model is predicated off buying properties for 40, 50, 60 cents on the dollars guy. And when you can do that, whether the market is up, down, sideways, left, right, whatever, right? If you can understand how to buy properties for 50 cents on the dollar, you're going to have a lot of different options. And then the second thing that I would do is one of the things when I first started that looking back, I would have done differently once I did step number one is I wanted to flip every single house. I had basically told myself I'm going to be a fix and flipper. And for the first two years, that's literally all that I did. Whether it made more sense to wholesale or I, it made more sense to keep it as a rental or whatever, I tried to force everything down the path of fixing and flipping because I had convinced myself that that was the way to maximize the amount of profit that I could make from the deals that were coming in between. And I would be a little bit more open, not a little bit, I would be more open to different exit strategies, right? Because when you only have one exit strategy, that deal can only work here. But if you have, and you, and you learn how to do three or four different things, right? All within the same lane, but you can do three or four different options. You just have more tools in your tool belt and you're going to convert more opportunities. Guys like us that come from a sales background, right? We always talk about conversion. We have these leads and these opportunities that come into the top of our sales funny funnel. And we want to convert as many of those as we possibly can. And fixing and flipping is just one option and it's not always the right option. So I would do those two things if it were me. That's awesome. So again, what I would do again, full-time employee traveling around the world, wants to buy and hold, you know, has, has visions of getting to four. That's, that's who I was at the beginning mm -hmm. of this. So step one, step two, never changes. I would get a buy box again in early. It was nine, three, seven, oh, three, three and four bedroom homes, two baths, single story, 12 to 1500 square feet, something like that. That wouldn't change. Cause again, I don't know Fresno. I've still never spent the night in Fresno. Um, I didn't know anybody. It just made sense cash flow wise, right? Cause the Bay area where I lived didn't. So I would get a buy box. I would look at that buy box for, I don't know, 90 days or whatever it is. I travel around, meet people, network more, um, but what I would probably quickly find out today is stuff doesn't cash flow, mm. right? Given current cost of capital, uh, given where rents are, stuff's negative, right? What it's I call problem. an alligator. Yeah, it's a yeah. problem. So I would probably spend 90 to 120 days trying to figure that out. I would try to beat up my spreadsheet. It just wouldn't work. So again, knowing what I know now, but not having anything, I would pivot to seller financing. Mm. I would be going after sellers who uh, who have property probably with greater than 50% equity, 60, maybe free and clear. And I would probably directly market or I would look for on-market listings with equity because I would try, I'd be, basically I would be trying to turn a seller into a bank. And if I turn the seller into a bank, I can get below market rates. I don't really give a rat's ass about the price. If I can pay their price, but get 2% money, it probably cash flows, right? Yep. 
So that's that's what I would do. Again, rule number one and number two don't change. I do it every time. Buy box market, learn average. In today's market, I'm not kidding myself. It'd be negative cash flow. That's bad. I can't get a bank loan and cash flow. Don't do it. So then I would probably pivot to seller financing. And that's why I think the event on the 19th is going to be amazing because I think that is the answer for most people. It's sell of, seller slash creative financing. Maybe that's, I mean, something I've never done. I don't know if you've done it. VA loans are assumable. How cool would it be to assume a VA loan in today's market on a basically new home at 2.2%? Yep. Yep. Folks, if you're in Fresno, I'll take those all day long. Right. And so. there's going to be a lot of people that have bought with there's always guys. This is what happens. There's always going to be a life event that happens, regardless of what's going on in the economy, where there's people that just need to walk away from a property or sell it or whatever. Right. And so there's going to be a lot of people that have bought in the last two, three years that just find themselves, unfortunately, in one of those circumstances and giving them that option where a fix and flipper like me is not going to be able to make the deal pencil because of just the way that the numbers are. Right. They, they still need to sell the house. Right. And so giving those people those options and going back to my point of just not trying to fix and flip, but having a creative or a seller finance option in the toolbox is going to be important. Let me give the fix and flippers a tactical piece of advice on top of what I what I said initially. So what I would also do is you need to run your numbers differently, guys. So beyond the first two things, which, again, for me and my model, step one and two are going to be the same. Step number three is we have to be more conservative with how we're running our numbers. So if we have active comps that right now, that have, and when I say active, it's not six months. Ideally, it's 30 to 60 days, but really 90 days is the absolute max that I would go back. Anything beyond that, guys, is not going to be a comp that an appraiser is really going to look like or look at or I feel is going to apply in what is going on in our market right now. So only look at a shorter window of comps and you've got to adjust down at least 10 or 15% depending on exactly what type of property is, right? So if that house sells for $300,000, you've got to bring it down 30 or 35,000. That's got to be your projected resale value, right? Your projected resale value, your ARV is not 300 on that house. It's now 270 or 260 or somewhere in that range. And then you've also got to account for longer holding costs, right? So the three or four really big things are what are we going to sell the house for, right? How much is it going to cost us to fix the house? And how much is it going to cost us just to hang and borrow, hang on to the property and borrow the money, right? Those are the really the three big expenses that you need to account for besides your profit margin, right? So when you're calculating deals, start with those three. So you have to adjust down your after repair value and you have to adjust up your holding time, right? Two, for the last two years, 90 days. I mean, realistically, if we get in the house and it's vacant and we can start, I felt very comfortable that we can say within 90 days, we're going to be in and out. So we would do 90 to 120 days. Now it's a minimum of six months. I don't care. I don't care if it's vacant. I don't care if it's just a cosmetic fixer. We're putting six months worth of holding costs on every single thing uh, that we get. And if we sell it sooner than we make more money, guys, guess what? It's a bonus. But if you can <laughs> make the deals work with a more conservative after repair value and a more conservative holding time. If you can make the deals work, then we're going to pull the trigger on it. And if you do it better, then you get rewarded. But it's the people that try to make the deals work with an aggressive ARV, with really short holding times, with really tight rehab budgets. They think they're only going to make 30 grand. And then at the end of the day, they either lose money or they break even or they make $5,000. And it's better to work a day job guys than do projects like that. And I've done plenty of those in my life. So I'm speaking from firsthand experience. Don't do that to yourself. Um, be more conservative with how you're running your numbers right now. Yeah. And then kind of wrapping up for the buy and hold investor again, buy and holds about building wealth. You're, you have a day job, you're traveling the world as I was, uh, don't do bad deals. No alligators. Don't be in a rush. If, if don't do negative cash flow. I still hear so many people say something like, Oh, I've got this high fluting job. I can handle negative 200 bucks a month. Are you kidding me? You're going to just light 200 bucks on a, a month on fire. And that's in the yeah. best case. What happens if something breaks? Trust me, it is not worth it. Not do what happens. What are you going to do when? Because it's going to happen, right? <laughs> exactly. What are you going to do when the tenant leaves? Try, guys, Zuber and I are speaking from firsthand experience. It's not what if. It's inevitable, these things that we're talking about. So if you're if you're watching, you can learn so much, guys. This is like 
Like I always say networking is like the cheat code to life because you basically can tap into a guy like Zuber or tap into a guy like me. We've already had all of these painful experiences and we've yeah, done. I got, the I got learning scars for you. right yeah. back here. So don't, don't like reinvent the wheel guys. Like we've, we've done it and we can shortcut it for you. So when you see something like that, it's an automatic non-starter, right? Like it's just a no. It's negative cash. No, no. That means no. Let's move to the next deal. Right. And most people get Don't too laser to focused on it. a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah this, you know, you know, you and I've been in sales in a long time. Uh, how many times have you, have you seen a sales rep? I don't know what the quota, 2 million bucks, whatever it is. And yeah. they got one deal. Yes. They're yeah. carrying that one deal. They're not building pipeline. They're not doing anything else. That one deal. And then I'd yeah, see it gosh. all the time as sales. I'd have the guys, my, like when I was a sales manager back in the day, dude, I just see it. And I'd be like, dude, I don't know, man. I would say, let's get your That's pipeline full with some life. other stuff. It is a very stressful life, man. And then when you're, when your pipeline or your deal flow, we call it our deal flow. If our, our deal flow is not all there, what happens? Even if that one closes, it's great, but you have nothing else. Like you yeah. literally have no other, other, other deals to be looking at guys. We always have to keep our deal flow full of viable options, man. So. Yeah. Very, very cool. Jason, do me a favor. Where can people find you? On Instagram and Facebook are the two uh, best places to get in contact with me. I, I share all the ups and downs and in-betweens of our business every single day on there. I'd love to uh, answer questions or be a resource if I can for uh, for the viewers. So just put my name in uh, either one of those platforms, guys, Jason Pritchard, and uh, I'll pop right up. Yeah, do me a favor, folks. If you are following One Rental at a Time, please go follow him on Instagram. He, uh, he deserves a, a, a huge following. And uh, it's, it's something I go to today and just smile. Your stories that you put out are just so real. Uh, I appreciate it, man. Thanks again. Thanks, buddy.